everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. I've spoken before to Street Solidus community a long, long time ago, and I've since gotten busy with like the business problem space and other stuff and disengaged from the community. It is my intention to engage with you guys again, help out, talk, discuss, come up with solutions. Uh, and this was perfect timing. Thank you, Thomas, for reaching out and inviting me. And without further ado, I'm going to shut off my cam and go to the slides. Already. <sighs> Front end 2021. I am Dennis. I work for FCP Euro. We are a German car parts store, and we were one of the earlier adopters of the C framework at kind of like the medium scale of things. Front end is something I like talking about a lot because it is something large stores and medium sized stores focus on. There's a lot to gain, there's a lot of business specificity surrounding how to present, how to brand, how to do all the stuff with the end user. But I'm also a performance nerd, and front end is where a lot of the performance is either made up or lost. So that is why I like to focus on it a lot. And so uh, the previous talks I've done on this have also been with the performance focus. So this talk really builds on that and kind of does a little refresher for everybody and a reminder that this is still important going into 2021. Performance front ends are important for a couple of reasons. It is the ultimate benchmark for the UX that you are creating for your visitors. Good performance front ends yields more money. This is a well researched uh, subject. It's very important for any website to work well, but especially for us in the e commerce uh, space. And Google has always paid attention to this, but as you'll see, they're going to pay more attention to it in 2021. So, because it yields uh, a better and user experience, they are interested in generating organic result pages that will satisfy visitors. And so this is a direct uh, interest for them. As of this morning, to fcpr.com over the last month, 61.91% of that traffic was mobile, and an additional 2.25% of the total web traffic that we received was tablet. That makes for two thirds of all web traffic on sub standard size viewports if you were to compare it to desktop. The other thing that means is that the computing resources are limited and that the network may not be up to par. So, the other thing you are doing when you're writing high performance front ends is you're optimizing for the majority of your traffic, which may not have the luxury of the computing resources or the network latency that you enjoy on desktop which you probably developed the platform on, it's very important to uh, test against that as well. So really, there's a lot to gain from following some of these conventions. Core Web Vitals is really what this talk is about. And it is a new set of metrics developed by Google. Google has a fantastic HTTP performance team, the team for the betterment of the internet. And they have invested heavily into educating the creator segment, educating the end Excuse me, and consumers even, they've built the world's fastest browser. They spent a lot of energy on this. And this is something uh, straight from the core web vitals website. Optimizing for quality of user experience is key to the long-term success of any site on the web, whether you're a business owner, marketer, or developer. Web vitals can help you quantify the experience of your site and identify opportunities to improve. This is right on the recommend page. If you allow it, you have to I'll give you a URL. What this represents our three new metrics. LCP, largest content full paint, FID, first input delay, CL, cumulative layout shift. You do all of this and you have a lot to gain. Largest content full paint, LCP represents what we have all been traditionally looking at when evaluating our planet. It is essentially about how fast the interface in front of the user loads. It helps the user answer one important question. Is this page useful? So from the point of view of an organic search giant, they want the user to be able to identify if this result is something they're looking for or not and be able to go back to the results page right away. Unlike the traditional load and DOM content loaded events, this is actually a user-centric metric. It does not care about the state of JavaScript. What it cares about is how much of useful content shows up how soon. The elements considered when constructing this score are anything that is visually significant in the user's viewport, anything that is semantically significant as well. So 
think that there's lots of other elements with dramatic backgrounds, videos, and most importantly, text plots. And the way it's measured is the viewport changes and, con and uh, layout reflows are constantly instrumented, and the surface area is measured at intervals. The common pitfalls of a low score here is a slow server response time, because as you know from previous talks and just probably general experience, it pushes the entire critical render path back, whatever amount of the server response time plus the network latency. Anything that blocks uh, rendering from the JS or CSS standpoint, uh, resources that are slow to load that are competing for network resources and things like that, or if any of the important content is being loaded through uh, any kind of additional network uh, inter interchange and client side rendering traditionally has had a really, really tough time scoring high in this because after the initial bootstrap of the page, there's additional logic and additional stuff that has to happen. So anything uh, that uses uh, JavaScript templating and stuff like that will certainly impact the score. The other thing we're talking about is uh, the first input delay. It is timing instrumentation that measures the delay between the user's first interaction with the page and how quickly the web page can respond to that. It only measures the first input, again, as a means of measuring the first impression of how responsive the page is to the user. And the most common pitfall here is burdening the main thread. So that uh, will result in slow response time. To optimize this, nothing you guys haven't heard before. But just to drive it home, we critically evaluate all third-party JavaScript that's going into the page and how it creates events, listeners, and things like that. Of the JavaScript that you have, you really want to reduce it. JavaScript parsing time and execution time. You want to consolidate your request into as few and as quickly uh, downloadable as possible. And again, you want to pay very critical attention to the main thread and how that is being consumed by your given page. The last thing that is really important, this is really the one where F0 has a lot to gain without even being aware of it until we started really looking at this earlier in the year, is the cumulative layout shift. What this is, is a measurement of the visual stability of the page as the page continues to load in front of the user. What it measures is unexpected layout changes relative to the visible viewport and any given device. A high score here means the page was stable and nothing unexpected happened. Nothing happened out of order. The way this is measured is as the page is being loaded, any change or reflow that happens to the layout is documented. The surface area of the viewport that had to move is multiplied by the fraction distance it has to move within the viewport. There are a couple of things that traditionally cause a poor CLS score, and that is images without dimension. It was news to me that images, when declared without explicit width and height attributes in HTML, or rather, images that do have the explicit width and height uh, declared right in the HTML, actually don't represent that statically. And then the HTML specification will still be resized down to the container. The significance of providing dimensions for the images is so that the renderer can figure out the aspect ratio. What happens then is it reserves that space, given the constraining block level element, and then as everything is loaded beyond the image, the loaded image doesn't have to suddenly push everything down. What that creates is a much more pleasant experience for the user. It does not shift clickable and interactive elements. So as the image is loading, the buttons won't shift. We've all had that experience where some sort of an ad or something loaded after the fact moves everything down and we click the wrong button. That is what the score is trying to prevent through education of the creative segment. So this happens with ads that are embedded or any kind of iframes, you can think about dimensions, any kind of dynamically loaded content after the fact. So you can think of perhaps Ajax requests or anything of that effect, anything loaded with JavaScript via network call will impact the score as well as fonts. So fonts after they're downloaded can render at a different height for a different point, uh, for a same given point size and that will cause problems as well. It's good to know about this, but how to practically approach this. There are a couple of ways. So Lighthouse is something Google has been building into Chrome for a long, long time. It is available in your inspector tab. It is uh, an entire API that comes with the browser that allows you to audit not only on core web vitals, but also mobile usability, SEO, and other things like that. 
that tool alone is probably one of the most useful things you can be doing as somebody who has a tenant. But benchmarking in the lab, as they say, which is a synthetic environment, from your end computer is not always useful because that is not representative of your visitor demographic. So, and also it depends on your specific computing resources in the moment and your specific network throughput in the moment as well as latency. PageSpeed is a website by Google that does that from a central location. So you can keep benchmarking any given page consistently with the same amount of resources and the same network every time. Pre, post deployment, score changes, that is how I like to do it. That is synthetic laboratory data. It is not representative. It is representative of the visitors actually coming to your website, but it obviously has a margin of error. This data is also constantly being collected by Google in the field. Actual real world users' experiences on actual real world cases. This is done through something called Chrome EX support, where people using Chrome actually under the hood without, or maybe with their consent, are reporting, the browser is actively reporting their experiences back up to Google headquarters. But this data is available to you as a store owner through Google Search Console. You will not get specific numbers, you will not get specific scores, but you will see when your pages are underperforming and where they are underperforming. All of the information presented here is going to be available, or actually the canonical source for all of this and where it's coming from is web.dev slash vital. Google's resource on the improvement of the summit. So all of this is described at length. Anything mentioned up to this point and after this point, this is really where you would want to go if you're interested in securing this place. But back to sports. So this is a screenshot of the Google page speed website. There's a lot of information here, but it's all very neatly presented. And you can see in the field data right there, you're looking at first content full paint, which is an earlier representation of LCP. Then you have the largest content full paint, FID, and CLS as the cell. There's additional stuff here for field data and lab data. You can even see origin summary, which will represent data for the entire website, not just that page. And you get your simulative score as well as a set of screenshots at the bottom. Now, uh, and the timeline of how that really was rendered to the poltergeist or whatever they're using on the hood. The thing I want you to notice here is that I'm only showing you the mobile viewpoint. We as a company have committed a long time ago to serve universal responsive interfaces, regardless of viewport size, regardless of the user agent to all of our web traffic. So our problem space for optimizing the front end is really optimizing the mobile version of how that looks. If we are successful in optimizing the mobile viewport, we have already succeeded in optimizing the desktop end. If your store serves conditional fallacies or conditional markup, or you have an entire M dot subdomain or other packages like that, this is going to be different for you. And that is why Google offers both the desktop version of this test and the mobile version of this test. But if you're like us, if you optimize the mobile viewport, you've already won the game. It's much more difficult to optimize for mobile because of the constraints measured, uh, stated earlier, which is computing resources and network resources. But if you log into the Google Search Console, which as a store owner, you should be looking at, there's a, a lot of really interesting data on the back end available to you. You will see something like this for the mobile and desktop versions of your URL. If anything is underperforming here, You'll see it show up on the graph, and you will see after clicking report, open report top right, you will see a list of all the pages and which segments they are underperforming in. For FCP Euro, this was predominantly cumulative layout stuff earlier in the year. So we just recently got done improving the score, and we are constantly working on improving the score. So we never stop evaluating ourselves on the core web vital set of metrics. And I recommend you guys do the same. Here's why all of this matters. And specifically right now, again, there's a refresh enthusiasm from Google's end to keep pushing for these standards. The ranking changes described in this post will not happen before next year, and we will provide at least six months notice before they rolled out to Google on May 28th, 2020. They have still not given us notice for this exact algorithm update. But you can certainly expect it. And by the way, the reason for this is they are actually going out of the way to allow website owners 
and store developers to deal with the direct consequences of COVID-19. So they are waiting to let everybody decompress from the difficult times we're going through before they create this additional hurdle for the owners. What that means from all, for all of us here is that we have at least six months from now to evaluate our biggest projects and make changes and improvements so that we are ready and are ahead of the market when it comes to reaping the benefits of not just the users that are happier that are giving us more money, but also search engines favoring us and putting us higher up on the search engine results page. Um, we can do a Q&A on all of that if you guys would like, uh, but I also prepared a couple of quick pro tips that I found that are, let's say, tangentially related to the topic of front end and not necessarily indirectly. Uh, I want to quickly mention something we discovered about the Chrome Nocast directive treatment and a uh, little note about uh, content delivery networks and how that has changed recently, as well as a way to pipeline uh, apps that are retrieval in any Rails application that especially relevant. So speaking of instrumenting success of your online store, I would wager that most of us use Google Analytics. And a problem we had with Google Analytics is the transaction tracking. Our business is very keen on using data metrics and setting performance standards for the business. So we constantly look at how successful we are within the given parameters of a week. And what we kept seeing is that our metrics are off. If we use backend instrumentation for conversion rate or for total number of orders for dollar amount revenue, it was always lower than what the front end was reporting. Cal Bento, our marketing dude, figured out that we have duplicate transactions being logged in Google Analytics. This took us a while to figure out. I tried to wrap the JavaScript in a block level element that then the JavaScript could call out to and destroy on the off chance that any given browser's JavaScript runtime would evaluate it twice. So the self-destructing letter did not fix that. Then we tried to introduce the no cache tag, which it turns out a directive, a header directive, uh, which turns out Rails already includes with all dynamically generated pages as it should. It took us a while to figure this out, but through <laughs> aggressive Googling and repeatedly coming back to this issue, we found this. So for whatever reason, Chrome does not honor no cache directives, at least not in a way that you would expect. So what ended up happening is Chrome would essentially store the HTML that was returned for a successful order, which, as you remember, only shows the conversion tracking JavaScript once, and it does this through Flash, which is session-based, self-expiring piece of, well, it can be anything, really, piece of data, let's call it. So if you were to refresh the page, the Flash would have expired, and the conditional part of the view showing the transaction tracking code would not be rendered. However, Chrome was not doing that and was using the previously returned HTML. So what this meant is after somebody completed a purchase with us and went forward with the website, should they head back, instead of sending that request again, Chrome would restart that page causing in a duplicate transaction. The way to avoid that is to create something like what you see in front of you. So this is a three orders, solid as orders controller uh, decorator. It introduces an additional filter uh, happening before the show action, which is both the order completion page and the historical order view page. And what it will do is add that additional directive, no dash store. You can see it's the last one on the right. This and only this finally fixed my problem. So if you guys are experiencing that problem, you can take that back to your clients for your stores today. Very important. <laughs> it was very important for us and took a while to figure out. The other thing is traditionally the advice would be consolidate all of your assets and serve them through a content delivery network. Why content delivery network? Well, because your assets, all the dependencies of every HTML page will be persisted as close to the user as possible. And that means dramatically reducing the network latency to and from. That is a bit outdated in the sense that, sure, you should still be doing that, but these days you can do something so much more. And that is the concept of not just delivering content through for your assets, but also routing your entire web tier through top-level domain routing services like Cloudflare. It will not only automatically introduce the benefits of content delivery network to you, but because all 
of your entire front end goes through the same choke point, you no longer have to introduce things like DNS resolution tags, prefetching tags, and other things of that sort. The other benefits you would get from this is a firewall, distributed denial of service protection, asset optimization. What do I mean by that? I mean this platform can resize your images and optimize your images losslessly and do a lot of stuff with your JavaScript and style sheets. It is really a fantastic product. All take a look at Cloud Player for any medium to large size business. And rate limit, obviously the amount of edge locations is just vast. And uh, <clears throat> for more advanced applications, you can do things like load balancing as well. And finally, this is something that you will not see dramatic benefits from, but it's a nice little thing to know and to be able to implement in your application. And for some people, it might actually provide very significant improvement. We found that in our custom front end, our multiple pages were accessing settings or any, any back end mutatable value. So in our case, it's the simple banners, promotional banners, and links of where those banners should take visitors that the marketing team can change, but really it could be anything. So on any given page, if you had to make multiple requests, you know that serializing requests is bad, and you should really parallelize all of them as much as possible. Well, there's actually a very easy way to do that with, with certain caveats. If your backend of this sort, in this case, there would be uh, three preferences, which are internal. Uh, custom settings class inherited from, as you'll see in the next slide. If that is using memcached under the hood, you actually have a device to do this. Very conveniently, they go right in. So the total savings here aren't dramatic because for most people, memcached will live on the same server, on the same instance. But for larger stores like us, we had to centralize the cache store, centralize the session store, we use memcached for both of those. So that then means a little bit of internal network latency, even if you're on EC2 like we are. So the savings here are however many requests the memcache that you make, minus one, times the network trip latency one way, and then also that same network trip latency the other way. It looks very, very simple and it is very effective. Uh, so you can, here you can see a custom class inheriting straight from C preferences integration and a method that reads multiple keys that simply declares for each one of those keys a presence presence within the preferences, so preferences aren't surprised if they receive a request for something they're not aware of. And then simply a binary readout from the memcached instance that will return all of this and interpret it back into your Ruby instance. Very useful, quick, and you can actually dress this up with additional view layer helpers to get these values out and make this a lot nicer and a lot more useful to write in view. This is it, thank you for having me. As, uh, as everybody, as Thomas has said, and uh, as I mentioned, I will be happy to answer whatever questions I can, but the canonical resource for all of pretty much the first part of the entire presentation for Web Vitals is available online, and that is, I urge everybody to go and study that. There's a lot of fantastic resources there.